we're at. Today is going to be a good day, yeah? Multiple reasons why today is going to be a good day. We have got the Euro Finals later today. Who is excited? Come on, who is excited? Hey, you know what? It's okay. Some people are shaking their heads. It's okay to get excited about the football. It's all right. Right, it's not a sin to love football. It is a sin to be Italian today, but it's not a sin to love football. It's okay to get excited about that, but it's also very okay to get excited about being in church, about worshipping our God. Today I'm excited because I believe that today lives can be touched. Today I believe that lives can be changed. Today I believe whoever you are, wherever you are, that you can encounter God and your life can be different. So why don't you stand to your feet because we're going to worship. Kids, are you ready to worship today? You've got your batons ready? Have you got your voices ready? Have you got your legs ready? Have you got your arms ready? Because today we can give God everything we've got because you know what? He deserves it. He deserves our praise. He deserves our worship because He is God. He is good today. Let me declare that over you, that today God is good. He wants good things for your life. He is giving you good things for your life. And today He wants to make Himself known. So God, we give you all of ourselves this morning, God. We're going to give you our energy. We're going to give you our praise. We're going to give you our worship because you deserve it, Lord. And as we worship you, as we praise your name, as we lift you up, God, I ask that you would make yourself known in this place today. Amen.
overcome the grave. is 
I think we can do a little bit better than that. How can we not give praise? Come on, let's give God another clap, another cheer. How can we not? God, when we think of you, when we gaze upon your face, when we make ourselves aware of your presence, Lord, how can we not? How can we not give praise? And through our singing, God, we give you praise. But Lord, through our conversations, through our lives, through the day that we'll live tomorrow, Lord, let us give you praise, we ask. Amen. Amen. Hey, take your seats for a little bit. Hey, the kids are going to go out in a little bit, but we'll stay where you are for now, Mark. Um, uh, you're, I think you are going to be given a little something. We are going to celebrate uh, the Euros uh, right now. We're going to have a little bit of a competition, a little bit of a game uh, that's going to be going on. So you're going to be given a piece of paper. They are coming around now. Hopefully the England squad will be quicker tonight than our glamorous assistants. Who knows? They're doing their best. We are going to do England versus Italy. Make sure if we got some for the kids as well, that'd be fantastic. If you're not into football, it's okay. Some of these are cultural questions as well. Sally Ann is giving me a disgusted look at the back there. It's okay to be excited about football and God, by the way. You don't have to choose, like, God's big enough. Oh, I keep on saying this because someone keeps on looking at me, but it's okay. It's not a sin. Hey, so what we're going to do is we're going to ask you some questions. Uh, if you think the, uh, if you've got a 50% chance of getting it right, okay, I'll tell you right now, the answer is either England or Italy, okay? What you need to do is hold up your sign towards me, the one that you think is the answer, okay? Um, so we'll, we'll have a practice question first. If we could put the first question up on the screen, that would be amazing. I just need to clear the slide and we'll have the first question up. Here we go. Oh. Ah, so who is going to win tonight? Right, so put up the sign. That's fantastic, fantastic. All right, hold on, hold on, just one moment. Okay, and everyone apart from a couple of people are out, okay, because the answer is obviously England. So those of you that put Italy up, you are out, okay? That's how the rule game goes. You can't put your sign up anymore. Because um, see there, the answer on the screen, it tells us it is England. Uh, so question number two, let's continue. Uh, who has won more World Cups? The answer is Italy. England only ever winning one. Don't clap them. Crikey, I'm going to be kicking people out of church in a moment. We don't usually excommunicate, um, but today I will make some exceptions. Okay, so if you got it out, you can't put your sign-ups anymore. Number three, who eats more pasta? It is the Italians, they eat more pasta. They are the world's top pasta eaters. Oh, I've not put the answer up, it is Italy. Okay, but this one, who eats more pizza? Domino's. It is England, England eat more pasta. We are the third uh, highest out of countries to eat the most pas pizza. Italy are only number five. Okay. Who has the higher life expectancy? Is it the English or the Italians? It is the Italians. And uh, which country has the great population or the greater population? <laughs> Who? It is England by an extra seven million people. 
Uh, which country has had more monarchs? England or Italy? Some people, I'm sure, have been out and they keep on putting their signs up. Never mind. Cheats, just like the Italians. Uh, who has had more monarchs? It is England, Italy, only ever having four monarchs. Uh, and which country has had more popes? It is, of course, the... I've just realised that the kids are strategically sat this way and the answers are up on my screen here. I was wondering how they were doing so well. And they are all looking at my cheat screen above your head. Never mind. Um, so who's had more popes? It is, of course, the Italians with 217 compared to England's one. Uh. Okay, so which country is bigger? Flipping cheats. <laughs> I feel like we can give the game away now. The kids will look at the answers up there and you lot can look at the kids. It is the Italians. <laughs> and number, oh, I've lost it on my screen. You'll have to take over, Scarlett. Where was the espresso invented? It was, of course, Italy. Italy, and uh, we're back onto football. Number 11, kids, we're nearly at the end. We're nearly at the end. I thought more people would go out, but obviously they cheat. I've not even put the question up, but the kids already know the answer. Who has conceded the least goals in the Euro so far? It is, of course, England with just one uh, conceded goal. And the final question, who has scored the most goals so far in the Euros? It is the Italians. Well, there was lots of cheating going on, but well done. Give yourselves a round of applause if you actually got them all right. We're gonna move on to round number two. My hope was there was only be a couple of people left, but never mind. So can I have a couple of volunteers from the kids to represent? Uh, why don't the kids leaders pick up a couple of people? We're gonna move on to our penalty shootout. If you're watching from home this morning, uh, you could have taken part in that last one. This one, you can go and get a football and uh, aim it at your TV. That would be fantastic. You can do that. Uh, once the kids' leaders have picked a couple of people. Uh, two or three if it's really difficult to decide. Right, we're going to have a little penalty shootout. Come on up. How are you feeling? Okay, so the idea of the penalty shootout is to get the ball through these holes. These holes have different scores on the nets. Let's just show the guys out there and the audience at home. It's quite hard. I had a little practice run earlier and I got zero. Um, no pressure, Jacob and Lexi. All right, so who do you think is going to win? Me. Me. Are you representing England or Italy? Okay, England. All right, no pressure. But representing England is Jacob. Come on, Jacob. Oh, so close. Take the next one as well. Oh, he's got it on the rebound. <laughs> 10 points. Lexi, are you ready? Was he got 80? He's on 80 points. I thought he went in 10. Awesome. Lexi, no pressure, okay? But he got in 80. That's quite a high score. Who are you representing? Italy. Italy, good. So you're going to lose on purpose, right? Yeah. yeah. Safe art. That's what I would have said as well. Um, right, come on then, Lexi. Oh, she's gone over. Oh, well done, ball boy. We're not at Wimbledon, but uh, you're doing a great job. Come on then, shot number two. Oh. Retake. Retake. It's a retake. No, she's the Italian. She's got to lose. <laughs> Go on, retake. Go on, Lexi, your laces are undone. Oh, so close! But the English are the winners! Give everyone a round of applause. Um, I'll get you a prize later, but I've left it out the back. And kids, you can head up off to Mystery Manor for your programme today. It's been great having you in. Well done. I'm going to get the band uh, back up. Going to get rid of my football nets. 
I'll get them back out later if you want. You can have a go. I know some of you adults were very keen on that. Hey, so uh, our glamorous assistants are busy today. We're going to take communion uh, right now. They're going to come round and they're going to give you a little cup. If you're watching from home this morning, uh, please don't just ignore this part. Quickly run to your kitchen, uh, grab some bread, grab some juice. Don't worry if you've not got any bread, if you've not got any red juice. Grab something so that you can engage in what is going on uh, this morning. We're going to take communion. For us, this is a, something that we love to do as a church because it helps us to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on that cross and the freedom that that gives us each and every day in our lives. It says this. It's from the message version in Romans chapter 5. It says this. You know the story of how Adam landed us in the dilemma we're in? First sin, then death. And no one exempt from either sin or death. You see, because of sin, because of Adam's sin, because of our sin, there was a price that needed to be paid. That price is death. That sin disturbed relations with God in everything and everyone. But the extent of the disturbance was not clear until God spelled it out in detail to Moses. So death, this huge abyss separating us from God, dominated the landscape from Adam to Moses. Even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam did, by disobeying a specific commandment of God, still had to experience the termination of life, this separation from God. And that's the reality of our sin. That's the reality of the world that we live in. We get separated from God. God. That first relationship between Adam and God as they walked in the garden, as they talk, you know, when Adam sinned and when we sin, it gets terminated. It gets stopped because God, in his holiness, needs us to be holy. And so death entered the world. And maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe that's something that you can sometimes feel, not this physical death. You're here, you're living today, but maybe there's a, a spiritual death in you. Maybe you're not quite sure what's going on. Maybe it feels like you're separated from God. But that wasn't the end of the story. It finishes the verse like this. But Adam, who got us into this, also points ahead to the one who will get us out of it. And Adam, thousands of years ago, pointed ahead to when Jesus was going to come to earth and die for us on that cross, taking our sins, taking the mess that we have made of our lives, paying that price, dying for us so that we could live forever. So when these earthly bodies give up on us, we can spend eternity with God. But more than that, more than that, it's not just life when these earthly bodies give up on us. I believe that God gives us a full life now, an abundant life now and this is why we take communion is to remind ourselves of that and when we truly remind ourselves of that when we truly remember that it affects the way we live it's not just a distant memory it's not just oh I remember when I was back at school and this happened but it's a memory that affects the way that we can live today you see when we when we remember that our sin has been dealt with that we can live in freedom it affects the way that we act It affects the way that we worship. It affects the way we deal with other people because we know that God has forgiven us. When we face sickness, when we face temptation, when we face poverty, whatever we face, when we remember that Christ has died and risen and given us life, it changes the way we look on those and the way we deal with them. So we're going to take this communion some of you might struggle we've got these little cups the top layer is the bread the bottom layer is the juice uh, they can be a bit tricky but why don't you peel off that top layer right now on that little cup get that little wafer it's not Hovis it's not Warburton's I don't know what it is but it represents Christ's body broken for us this morning paying that price upon that cross 
Him giving up himself, hanging there so that our sins could be forgiven. So take that bread, eat it in remembrance of what God has done for us. Hey, why don't you peel back the next layer? Some juice in the non-alcoholic wine, non-alcoholic fruit juice. I don't know what it is. It's something wet and it's something red. I don't think it's poison. But it represents the blood of Christ. The blood that was shed for you and for me. His blood. His death so that we may have life. And today you can drink that in remembrance, true remembrance of what Christ has done for us. God, we thank you for your death, for your resurrection, Lord, for paying the price for our sins. God, for rebuilding that path to you Lord so that we could know you so that we could have relationship with you that that death sentence over our lives God being lifted being paid for by you so that we may know life now and for eternity God we thank you for your death we thank you for your resurrection Lord and we thank you for the promises that you have given us God and I pray just before we sing this next song Lord that you would remind some people, I believe there's some people here today that just need to be reminded and they need to remind themselves of some of the promises that God has given them. Maybe it's a promise someone has spoken over you a long time ago and you've forgotten about it. Maybe it's a promise that you don't quite believe anymore. But I believe that today God wants you to remember some of the promises that he's made. God does not break promises. God is a promise keeper. What he has said will come to pass. It's just a couple of people that just need to remember those promises. Maybe you've given up. Maybe you had a hope or a dream and you've given up on them. Maybe you think you've turned too far, you've messed up too many times for God to use you. Hey, God's promised the opposite of that today. He wants you to know that today. God's promises are true. He is a king that never gives up. He is a king that will make the way for us today. So God, I pray that we would remember, we would remember those promises we would remember your truth, Lord God. My ask. Amen. Hey, we're going to sing again some truth. So why don't we stand to your, to your feet? You can just leave your little cups on your chair. It's fine. Deal with them at the end. Because we're going to worship our God again today. So let's do that.
inside of each one of us today, God, and that you've given us life everlasting. We just thank you for every truth in that song, God, every truth that we've learned from your word today, God, about the new life you've given us and the hope we have in you. Amen.
always helpful to have a microphone as loud as my voice is. I try not to remember or forget that one. Hey, it is good. I've talked already quite a bit today, so you'll be glad to know that I'm going to try my very hardest uh, to not talk for very long now. Um, but hey, no guarantees. We are starting a new series today, which uh, I think is incredibly exciting. For the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at something called Everyday Supernatural. It's based on a book uh, written by two guys, one called Mike Pilavachi, uh, one called Andy Croft. They uh, head up a church in Watford called Soul Survivor, and they used to put on conferences for thousands and thousands of young uh, people every summer. Uh, and they wrote a book called Everyday Supernatural. Uh, and it's all about the Holy Spirit. It's all about our lives and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at this. If you want to grab a copy of the book, on Amazon. You can do that. Then you can cheat. You can look ahead and already know what we're going to be preaching about. Also, if um, you have the YouVersion Bible app, maybe that's how you do your devotions. Uh, there's a Bible reading plan based on this book as well. You can search that out, Everyday Supernatural. That might be one that you want to follow along with. It's a great little devotion. But we're going to be looking at everyday supernatural. Now, I don't know what you think of when we say the words, the Holy Spirit. Uh, maybe you have different memories come to your mind, maybe different thoughts. Maybe you think of some past experiences. Maybe you think of some powerful moments in church where you've really encountered the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, though, when I think of the Holy Spirit, um, I think of some really weird people. I don't know if that's just me. Um, probably is, but I reckon there will be a couple more people, but you'll be too embarrassed to say it today, um, who just seem to be really strange. And for quite a while, if I'm going to be open and honest with you this morning, which I'll always try to be open and honest with you this morning. Sometimes when we talk about the Holy Spirit, I can get a little bit freaked out and a little bit worried because I remember people from my past that were like, oh yeah, very Holy Spirit. And I just thought they were complete nut jobs, if I'm honest. And I reckon you probably know some people like that. Maybe you're looking at me this morning and thinking, well, Marcus, that's you today. And I remember once, even at Bible college, we used to have these, um, you know, at the end of the year, we'd have these week-long lectures uh, all around uh, specific subjects. And uh, one was on the Holy Spirit, week-long lectures on the Holy Spirit. And I remember one time there was a practical session. It was all about prophecy. And we're going to be looking at prophecy in a few weeks' time, hearing from God. And uh, prophecy, though, is kind of like hearing from God and giving words to other people. And I was so worried. I was so nervous because I knew in my mind that certain things to do with the Holy Spirit scared me or freaked me out a little bit, or there was things that I was uncertain uh, on. And so I thought, I know, because I thought, well, if I go to this class and there's this prophet here and he's getting all practical sessions, he's going to call me up and he's going to tell me about this. Uh, and so I thought, no, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to skip the lecture. I'm going to hide in my room instead, or I'm going to go for a walk. So I was just off walking. I was just about to leave the grounds of our Bible college when along came the lecturer and he said, oh, you're coming to our next session, aren't you, Marcus? And I was like, oh, great, what am I going to do now? Um, so I said no and left. Um, but hey, I don't know about you, but sometimes we can get a little bit like, oh, what is the Holy Spirit? Maybe we don't fully understand what the Holy Spirit is and how that can make a difference in our lives. On Friday nights, we have movie night in our house. And so we, we make pizza and we sit down in the front room and the kids pick a, a movie to watch. It's like a little tradition. Um, and so this week, you know, we, we were getting a little bit bored of some of the movies that they choose. And so Sean had written a list for the girls to choose from. And one of the movies was one of the best movies ever made, um, Karate Kid. Um, you can disagree with me if you want, but you're wrong. Um, uh, anyway, so I thought, well, they're too young to introduce them to the original Karate Kid, but we did introduce them to the remake uh, of the Karate Kid. So uh, we're, we're watching this, and I, I love it. I'm into it. Karis, my oldest, she's into it. Sean, she's sort of into it. Um, 
Saren, however, keeps on moaning. She's like, I hate this movie. It's rubbish. I don't like it. So we're like, Seven, you just need to try it a little bit. You just need to try it. So it keeps on going. 20 minutes in. No, can't we watch something else? I don't like it. No, no, Saren, we're watching this film. Anyway, about an hour into the movie, we suddenly realize and you, that half the movie is in Chinese with subtitles on. Well, Saren, our daughter, she's only five. She couldn't keep up with reading. <laughs> And so no wonder she didn't like the film because she didn't understand what was going on. Hey, and sometimes that can be us with the Holy Spirit. I think either we get freaked out by some weird people that have gone so extreme with the Holy Spirit, and it certainly is an everyday supernatural. It's freaky, weird stuff, or we don't understand the Holy Spirit. But I believe when we get these things right, when we say, hey, how do we live out the Holy Spirit in our everyday lives? It will make an amazing difference to our world. And so that's what we're going to be looking at for the next few weeks. Because, hey, we have this amazing gift promised to us of the Holy Spirit. And it can make an incredible difference in our lives. We're going to watch a little video right now. It's only short. Well, it's probably longer than a four, but of some people with some amazing abilities. Let's watch this clip. me no people are pretty awesome aren't they and there's some amazing abilities and skills in the world and people have been empowered to do some pretty amazing things and uh, I believe that Christians 
can have an amazing ability and power when we understand the Holy Spirit too. Now, on that video, there were a whole load of people with amazing abilities, amazing skills, and they, were, they weren't showing off, but they were performing, weren't they? They were doing something pretty cool. But um, sometimes I think as Christians, we can have all of this ability when we understand the Holy Spirit, when we have him living in our lives, but we were too nervous to do anything. You see, I believe as, as Christians, as people who follow Christ, as people who love God and as people who, who can be empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can be making an incredible difference in our world. I believe that we can pray for people and they can get better. I believe that we can have amazing insights and words of wisdom into people's lives that will change situations. I believe that we can cut people off from past hurts, from past pains, from things that have a, a hold on their lives. I passionately and I truly believe all of that. And I believe that when we take that into our world, lives can be changed. Lives can be different. But so often because maybe we've seen people that are so weird with their Christianity... Maybe we don't understand it. We keep those skills hidden. Not skills, but we keep that Holy Spirit hidden. And we're too nervous to apply what we've been given to the world. And as we look at this, everyday supernatural, our prayer, our hope is that we would not become weird, freaky Christians that put people off God that we would not be people that do not understand the Holy Spirit, but we would be people that can live everyday supernatural lives, making an incredible difference in the world by what we've been given. And I believe it is for the world, and we'll look more about that in a few weeks. So today, I've said I'm not going to talk too long, and I've already talked far too long. We just want to look at a little bit of an introduction, because you see, when we, when we understand the Holy Spirit, when we understand what we, what we can do when the Holy Spirit lives in us, there can be a temptation to chase that. We see it in the Bible, even people chasing the power that that can give them, and maybe the glory that that can give them. And we, we've seen, and I'm not saying they're, they're wrong, but we can see maybe the these televangelists, and it looks like they're just after some glory. And I know some people in my life who seem to have chased after the supernatural. They've chased after that power. So, you know, so it makes them look good. It makes them look amazing. People will say, oh, wow, isn't that incredible? Have you seen what Marcus has done? He's prayed for someone, and they've got, they've got better. And we can chase after the power. But that's never what we're called to do. You see, we have to understand, and this is what we're looking at today. The power is in the presence. The power is in the presence. The presence of God. And that is what we need to be seeking. We're not seeking glory. We're not seeking supernatural gifts. Actually, first and foremost, we're seeking the presence of God in our lives. I need a volunteer, someone that's not too scared to, to um, stand next to me when I've not got a mask on. Someone that's also a little bit brave. Someone called Tim, because no one else was coming up. Well done, Tim. Well done for wearing your England top as well. Very, very good. Hey, I just want you to hold your hands out, Tim. Not like that, like this. Receiving pose. We'll get onto that in week five, okay? Um, <laughs> Tim, if you could uh, just... Yeah, come on. You, you can do whatever you want, Tim. I think. Uh, there you go. Just, uh, just hold... I'm just putting some ice in Tim's hand here. How you doing, Tim? A little bit more? That's all right. There you go. You just hold that for me for a moment. Yeah, you're okay. I remember when I was younger, maybe not always when I was younger, it happens all the time, but I remember jumping into a river. Uh, and do you know what happened when I jumped into the river? It was cold and it was wet. And I got wet and I got cold. When we go to bonfires uh, and you sit next to the fire, what do you do? You start to get hot, don't you? Tim, what's happening to your hands right now? 
it's becoming a little bit of an endurance test. W why is it becoming an endurance yeah. test? Keep it really simple. It's uncomfortable. It's painful. It's uncomfortable. It's painful. I'm after. It's uncomfortable. It's painful because your hands are... You see, when you hold something, it affects you. When you're carrying something in your hands, it begins to change. You can put it down now, Tim, before your hands drop off. Oh, well, it's up to you. You can stand there for all, all preach if you want, mate. It's a, you see, but when we draw close to something, it changes us. When we hold something in our hands, it makes a difference to us. Just like Tim was holding that ice, it began to affect him. If we had kept him there for longer, it would have affected him more and more. And when we draw close to Jesus... It affects us. When we dive into water, we get wet. When we stand next to fire, we get hot. When you draw close to Jesus, we get power. Because the power is in the presence. The power is not anywhere else. The power is in the presence. And that's why we love to worship. That's why we love to pray. That's why we encourage you to read your Bibles. That's why we encourage you to spend time with God every day. That's why we encourage you to take him into every situation that we go into. Because the power is in the presence of God. When we hold him, when we keep close to him, when we say, God, I'm going to position myself next to you. There is power in that presence. Hey, it says this in Exodus 33. I love this. Moses, he's been out. They've, he's taken the people out of Egypt and they're wandering in the desert. And they're not in the promised land yet, but they're wandering in the desert. And Moses says this. He says, then Moses said to him, God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people Unless you go with us. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? So that verse again, how will anyone know that you're pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? Starts off, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Here was a man who understood that he needed the presence of God. God, if your presence isn't going with me, if I'm not going to be in your presence, I don't want to be there. If you're at church, maybe this church, and the presence of God is not there, hey, let's close down. Let's go to another church where the presence of God is is because there is nothing without the presence of God. That's why we invite God to come. We know he's already here, but we say, God, have your way. We love to plan. We love to put stuff together. We love to have run sheets. We love to have order, but we say, God, use that. And God, this is for you because the power is in the presence of God. It's not about us. It's not about the way we dress. You know, the presence of God doesn't come through, through the music. The presence of God doesn't come through a preacher wearing skinny jeans. It's not about how we dress. It's not about how we sound, but it's about who we are with. The power is in the presence. A few years ago, I was down in, in London at a conference, a, a leadership conference, HTB leadership conference, an amazing uh, conference held every year. I know some of you guys have been, and I was there a few years ago. I was there with a friend, uh, a guy called Matt, and uh, we were walking. We were just coming up into the entrance, and he saw some people that he knew, and uh, so he was off talking to them, and I was, I was just saying hello to a few of them, and uh, I was talking to this one guy, quite uh, this big guy. I said, hi, I'm Marcus. I know Matt through church. You know, um, he goes, oh, I'm Bob. Uh, and so we talked a little bit about that. And um, anyway, so I didn't know much. And we went to the conference afterwards and met up with him again. He said, oh, why don't you come back? Why don't you come back for a cup of coffee at the hotel? Um, mainly talking to Matt, but because I was with Matt, uh, I got to go along as well. Anyway, so we're in Kensington. Um, and it was, we walk up to this hotel and it is quite a nice hotel. Like, we're not talking the travel lodge that I usually stay at or, or, or even the Premier Inn. Okay, we're talking five-star, top-rate hotel. And it suddenly clicked 
in my mind who this man was that I was talking with. He had said, oh, my name's Bob. It was actually uh, Lord Edmiston. He's like nearly a billionaire, a uh, rich guy. And so I'm walking along with him, talking to him, not really knowing who he is. And we get to this hotel and I'm like, looking down on myself, I'm wearing shorts, I'm wearing trainers, I'm wearing a t-shirt. And I look at this hotel and I'm like, oh, oh. I'm not dressed for this. And I'm pretty sure that if I had tried to walk into that hotel by myself, the people at the door would have turned me away. But I didn't walk in by myself that day. I walked in with a Lord. And I got in. See, the power can be in the presence who we surround ourselves with. And I want to just say three real quick things today. I keep on saying real quick, and I'm going to go real quick from now. Hey, we've got to be a people that seek God. We've got to be people that seek God. David, one of our all-time heroes in the Bible, an amazing person. So much of the Psalms, he talks about seeking the presence of God. Let's go through some of these really quick. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only thing do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I don't want to dwell anywhere else. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He was a man that wanted to be in the presence of God. He went on in Psalms. He said, he goes, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my de- bed in the depths, you are there. He wanted to be a man that was in the presence of God. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. And David was a man who walked through some pretty dark valleys. If you, if you know much about his life and his story, he was a man who was hunted down, who, was, who his father-in-law was trying to kill him constantly. He, he had a life full of turmoil where his son overthrew him from the throne. He was a man who walked some pretty dark valleys, but he said, hey, I can be in the darkest valley, but I will fear no evil. For you are with me. We need to be people that seek the presence of God. It says, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. David's prayer, he knew without that presence, without the Holy Spirit in his life, he was nothing. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Are you getting the picture? Here was a man, one of our heroes of the faith. But he knew without the presence of God, he was nothing. So many of us want the name like David. We want to do what David did. We want to make a difference for God like David did. But do we seek God like David saw God? Do we say, God, I need your presence so no we've got to seek God but I want you to know as well as well as us seeking God that God is seeking you today God is seeking you you know what the first question that God asks us in the Bible first question he asks Adam and Eve it's where are you Where are you? And I believe that's the story of the rest of the Bible and of our lives. There is a God who is seeking you today. See, it's not just about us finding our way into God's presence, but God eagerly desires us to be in his presence. He wants us to be with him. Even when we distance ourselves from God, I believe that God draws closer to us. I believe God comes into our lives. I love it. In John chapter 1, the gospel of John, it says this, the word, so God becoming flesh made his dwelling among us. God stepped down from heaven 
and came into our lives, gave up everything he had to be with us. There is a God, and I want you to know this today, that is seeking you, has stepped down from heaven, the highest place into our world and into our lives. That is his desire to be with each and every one of us. He draws close to us. And you know what had been happening on for the last few hundred years before this? You know what? The people hadn't been following God. They hadn't been drawing close to God. There'd been no prophets. There'd been no nothing for a few hundred years. The people weren't close with God. But God said, hey, I'm going to come. I'm going to draw near to my people. God wants to draw close to us today. John goes on the gospel of John and he says these I am statements. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the gate. I am the way, the truth and the life. He's not saying I will point the way. He's not saying I will show you the way. But he's saying I am the way. It's me. The power is in the presence. It's me. Draw close to me. God with us, Emmanuel. Too often, I think, we try to get the church building full of people. But really, we should be getting the people full of God. See, we could have a building packed. We could have 300 people in this place this morning, thousands watching online, and it would be utterly stupid and useless if we're not getting people full of God. And too often we chase people, we chase the crowds, but we should be people that say, God, I'm chasing you. God can do far more with one person that is filled with his spirit, that is following his way, than he can with a thousand people that just want to look good and show up. God is seeking us this morning. So we've got to seek God. We've got to know that God is seeking us. And third, and finally, we've got to be people that act right for that relationship. We looked this morning as we were having communion in Romans 5, how we messed up, how our sin caused us to be separated from God. Now, God is full of love. God is full of mercy. Hey, and we've already talked about that this morning. We are never going to be too far away from God. And God is chasing us. He wants us to be in his presence today. But hey, God is still holy. God is still right. And he wants us to be like that too. Now, he's made a way possible. We can't do that by ourselves. We can't earn our salvation. We can't earn our righteousness. It's a gift given to each and every one of us. But it's a gift we need to accept. It's a gift that we need to take. Because, hey, when there is sin between us and God, I believe that is going to disrupt the presence of God. It's going to stop the power. We need to be close to God. Even in the great commission. It starts off like this. Then the 11, you know, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Note that they went where Jesus had told them to go. There was obedience there. They left the safety, the security of their homes, of the upper room where they were safe, where the Romans wouldn't be able to get them. And they left and they went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them. There was obedience right before he pours out the Holy Spirit upon them. And then they saw him and they worshipped him. We don't do worship to fill the time. We don't do worship to give people an opportunity to sing. We do worship because it is so important. When we see God, we worship. And then it says, but some doubted. Some doubted. And it's okay if you are doubting here. The next verse, it starts like this. Then Jesus came to them and said, notice, it didn't say, and then Jesus came to them and said, to those of you that are not doubting, it doesn't say that. It says, some doubted, but Jesus came to them, to all of them, those that were fully uh, believing and those who were doubting as well. And he said, hey, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. 
Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I am with you. They were going nowhere without the presence, without the power that was in the presence. God was going with them. God, if you're not going with us, don't let us go. He said this to his disciples, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you will know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You will also live. God wants to be close to you this morning. Know today that the power is in the presence. Let's get the band back up. How is Jesus present with us today? He's present with us through his Holy Spirit. The world may not see him, but we, we see him. Because he is in us today. The power is in the presence. I want us to make a commitment today. Hey, we're going to be looking at this for the last next few weeks. We've introduced the subject this morning, but there is a fundamental truth that everything else is going to be based on, and that is that the power is in the presence. Do not seek the power. Seek the presence. Seek the presence of God. It can make an incredible difference. It will make an incredible difference in your life. It's a fundamental truth, but I believe it's one we quite often forget. It's one we ignore. You see, when troubles come, do we always turn to God? Do we always say, yeah, God, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to commit myself over to you today or not. Because the power is in the presence. The power is in the presence of God. I want you to make a commitment today to say, God, I'm going to seek you. Not just on a Sunday when we come to church, but God, I want to make time in the week to seek you, to seek your face, to spend time with you. Put on a worship song as you have your breakfast in the morning when you drive to work, when you go for a walk. Say, God, I'm going to seek your presence. I'm going to seek your presence, God, because without your presence, there is nothing. Let our prayer today be like that of Moses. God, if your presence isn't going, don't send us there. We want to be a people of the presence, God. We want to be a people of your presence. Hey, so let's stand to our feet. We're going to worship God because God is good, because God deserves our worship. Today we're going to close by singing Chain Reaction. But no, Hey, there's power in the presence. The presence doesn't come through sad piano music, although sometimes that can help. Even in the Psalms, David played the, played the harp for King Saul. The presence is here because God is here today. So God, we thank you that you're here and we worship you this morning with all we've got. Let's worship God.
have a great week, everyone. Hopefully we'll see you in the week, online or in person. And we look forward to being back together next week. You can get a coffee now.